Please welcome Executive Vice President for Columbia Global, Wafa El Sadr, and the President of the Republic of Chile, His Excellency, Gabriel Boric Font. Well, good afternoon and welcome all to Colombia's World Leaders Forum. It's great to have you all here today for this very important conversation. I'm Wafa El Sadr, as you heard, and I'm the Executive Vice President for Colombia Global. I'm also the Director of ICAP and Colombia World Projects. And it's my pleasure to welcome you today to this leadership um, forum today, here in Lowe Memorial Library. Welcome, Your Excellency, President Gabriel Boric. It's great to have you here. Welcome to the First Lady, Mrs. Irina Karamanos, and honorable guests who are joining us today uh, from the Republic of Chile. I would first like to acknowledge uh, the co-sponsorship of this event by Columbia's Center on Global Economic Governance and our Institute of Latin American Studies. Thank you both for co-sponsoring this event. And we're very happy today to have the Institute's director with us, Professor Vicky Murillo, and who will be moderating the discussion today. Welcome, Professor Murillo. Uh, this has been a remarkable week at Columbia as we experience usually every year in the month of September. And it's been a great pleasure to have hosted many, many distinguished guests in this forum right here uh, this, this week. And therefore today we're really adding, uh, this is the last of the, uh, the, the forums for this, year's, um, for this year, uh, but nonetheless it is a very important forum. As you're aware, world leaders have come to Colombia because they appreciate the importance of engaging with the communities like the community of Columbia University. Uh, they know our wonderful students, our faculty, our staff are remarkable, and that our students come here to challenge as well as to be challenged, and that the students really represent uh, the generation of global citizens who will lead in the years and decades to come. At Columbia, we take very seriously our mission to engage with the world uh, beyond the academy and address the greatest challenges facing our global society. We call this the fourth purpose of the university as was articulated by our president, President Lee Bollinger. And initiatives like the World Leaders Forum, Columbia World Projects, and our global centers are evidence of the commitment uh, to this promise in action. Now, Columbia University has a long and extensive history of uh, relationships with Chile, the academic community, and governmental institutions. Uh, there's just a book that's been published of a 100-year history of collaborations and relationship between Colombia and Chile. And, um, and also the Columbia uh, Global Center in Santiago, which was officially launched in 2012, serves as an important base on a larger network of uh, global centers uh, to facilitate local in-country interactions and the development and execution of research and programs and training in Chile as well as also in Latin, elsewhere in Latin America. We are very pleased to host President Gabriel Boric today, who was sworn in just very recently in March of 2022 after a hard-fought election, congratulations, uh, in which he promised to lead Chile uh, transition into a fairer nation that better serves the interests of its people. Uh, for the students in the audience, you'll be happy to hear that the president got his political start as a student leader, uh, so that's good, and I'm sure he may share or may respond to your questions about that. And he rose to prominence in waves of unrest that rocked the country over deep inequities that have long plagued Chile as well as other countries in the region. In a speech actually at the UN General Assembly on Tuesday, the president drew on the experience of his own country and warned of the dangers of social unrest if governments were not responsive to the needs of their people. Today he will speak about all of this and more in the conversation with Professor Murillo 
and uh, it's an honor to host you today. And I hand over the stage to Professor Maria to start the conversation with the president. Welcome again. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, it's a pleasure to have this chance to have the conversation and an honor. And I, I have three questions, two of which are based on the student questions sent to us and one that's my own. And I want to start with one about yourself. You're a very young president, the youngest in Chile. And your political activism as a student was a crucial part of your political experience. You're now talking to an audience of students who want to learn from your experience. So can you tell us how did your political experience as a student activist shape your worldview and the political goals that you have set for yourself as president of Chile? Sure. Um, first of all, Thank you for inviting me here. It's really uh, an honor to be with you all. I think there might be people outside that uh, can enter. Uh, I don't care if they are stand. Uh, this is has been this. Uh, there is this is hybrid, so it's been shown in your. You can uh, watch okay. it in your computer okay. if you cannot be okay. inside. Uh, <laughs> oh, there, there is people. <laughs> there is people outside. <laughs> Didn't know. Um, or your phone, <laughs> because there is. Well, Hi guys. Um, I'll, I'll do my. As you know, uh, English is not my mother tongue. Uh, I'll do my best to explain myself in English. But if I can't, I think that you have translators. Uh, so I'll, I'll may, might be switching uh, language in, uh, in in with some ideas. Um, I I started in 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 politics. I like my. My reflection in politics uh, started when I was like 12 years old. Um, I'm from the south of Chile, from Punta Arenas, and it's really, uh, it's really far away from everywhere in the world. It's closest to Antarctica, uh, up, so you can imagine how it is. And uh, we felt really uh, isolated of the of, of Chile, actually, uh, but. I realized that there was a history, a history that we had in common uh, with, uh, and it was about suffering. Uh, I remember when I was really young um, asking my father about a protest that was happening in, the, in La Moneda, outside La Moneda, it's the, the, presidential, the, the, palace. the, the presidential palace, right? Um, and there were some people demanding or asking uh, where are their familiars because they were disappeared since the dictatorship uh, we had in Chile. And I was like 10 years old and I asked my father like, what's going on? Why did they, uh, the government doesn't tell them where they are? So my father explained me that something has happened in Chile uh, when, when I was, wasn't even born in 1973 and because of, uh, of that, of the uh, coup d'etat, there are people that is still missing. And I, I couldn't really understood it uh, at that time, but I felt like something was wrong. And I start, so I started reading. I started reading about history, and then I realized that uh, the Chile, the, the history that we were having in, at school uh, di didn't face the harms or, or the, the pains that our country had. And that made me really interested in learning more. And I understood qu quite uh, quickly that there's no way to change things but to compromise, but uh, to commit, sorry, uh, to, to commit. And I started with, and that couldn't be a uh, voluntary, or no, not a voluntary, an individual act. We had to aggregate in a collective way in order to change things. Um, we were very little, or very, uh, a very small group that thought that way in Punta Arenas in the 90s, uh, but we started reading, and so my, my first approach to politics was in school uh, because of the history of Chile, because of the wounds that we had. And then when I uh, went to, to, to college, to university, to Universidad de Chile, um, I, I realized that it was possible to change things, but not 
like screaming a lot. I, I understood that uh, radicality wasn't equal to screaming or saying a lot of adjectives, but uh, to convocar a mucha gente. Bring many people together. Bring many people together and convince. And so we started working on that and, and here we are. And wow. here we are. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Uh, the, it's <laughs> most of the students, most of the students, I would say at least half of the students' questions were associated to the recent place beside that Chile had. Sure. So uh, Chile had a lot of social unrest, as you all know, in October 2019, and that led to a constitutional reform. Uh, the majority of Chileans, 80% of them, of those who voted in the place beside, voted for a constitutional reform and a convention that was called and drafted uh, a new uh, constitution to replace the one established during the military dictatorship. Uh, however, in a recent place besides, a majority of Chileans rejected that draft of a constitution uh, by two thirds of voters. So what is your own interpretation of the rejection vote? And what would you think should be the new path ahead for fulfilling the mandate of drafting a new constitution? Well, first of all, this happened the 4th of September, quite like three weeks ago. So we are still, like everybody, it, it was a, a, a result that uh, it was a surprise in its magnitude. The difference was, was uh, way much than everybody expected. Uh, so there's a lot to learn about it. As I said in the speech at the UN, I think it's a, I, I'm not sure if the, the word is correct, a humble bath, uh, un baño de humildad. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the expression is in English. No, um, uh, well, to it, feel it, humble. It, uh, yeah, it, it, it forced us to uh, look at the things we were doing in a more humble way, and to understand that Chilean people, Chilean people, the, the the big majority, as you said, voted for a new constitution in in October 2020, uh, but not any constitution. They want changes, but they, but the people in our country won't want uh, changes with with certainty, uh, with progressivity. Uh, not from big changes won't uh, be done from night to day. And I think the 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 main one of the of the mistakes that. We, and I say we because I feel I voted for approval in the Constitution. Uh, I wasn't part of the Constitution, but I feel really part of the process. Um, is that we, we thought at one time that we could go uh, faster without bringing uh, everybody with us. And one of the big lessons that we have learned through history in Chile, through history, and uh, y you can tell that about the, the, uh, what happened in, in the 70s, is that for big changes, you need big majorities. And for big changes, you need, and you need to build those big majorities, and that won't happen from one day on or, or another. And that, uh, even though we had large demonstrations, large, uh, not only protests, uh, not only, well, a lot of protests, but big demonstrations, a lot of people in the streets, but that's not enough. You have to build, uh, as, as, well, as Gramsci said uh, in, in, in back in the days, uh, you have to work a lot to build uh, hegemonia. Uh, hegemony? Hegemony. Hegemony. You, you have to work a lot. And uh, we went faster than what the people wanted. And so the people of Chile said, stop. Uh, and we have, we have to respect that, to understand that, and to um, get back one step in, in order to advance uh, two or three more. I'm pretty sure that we will get a new constitution in our period, and the Congress is now discussing which, the, which the, is gonna be the, the, the procedure in order to, to accomplish that. 
but also we cannot lose from sight the difficulties that people are going are passing through nowadays. Uh, as we are from, uh, I'm a leftist, uh, a leftist, yeah, and uh, I, I, and I'm not afraid of saying it, but people from the left side of um, politics have to understand that promises and the, the promises of a better world way ahead won't uh, bring safety, certainty, and um, better quality of life if we, if we don't work hard on management also. So we have to find a balance in between the, the big structural reforms that we are aiming and the day-to-day -day life, the day-to-day -day life, and we are working hard on that now. I, 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 I will have a follow-up on this, so what's your plan for this every day reaching to the people on their uh, issues that are more important and emerging? I mean, is there any particular way that you want to approach that, yeah. given that you also want to bring majorities? Well, there are a lot, a lot of things to say about that. Um, first, one of the main problems um, that we are facing now, nowadays in Chile is security. And the, so I mean, security, the... Personal security. Yeah, personal security. And, you know, the, the left parties ha, have never been able to talk, we always talk only about the, the roots of the problem, the, the big explanations, but when the homicide rate is growing, uh, you'd want also an answer now. And we have to be able to give an answer. We, when we were students, we fought against the police. I was uh, in prison a couple of times for that. And I do not re regret at all of what we did because it was protesting, not, uh, I, I didn't, uh, I know there's press here, I didn't do anything, I, uh, I, <laughs> I couldn't tell them. You didn't uh, commit but, but any crime. Yeah, I didn't commit any crime, uh, but uh, we, we now have another responsibilities and we have to provide safety to our people. Uh, and that it's not contradictory, and th there, there are uh, like it's like uh, there's a trauma in in the left parties in the left parties to talk about security, and we have to offer security to our people. Also, uh, we are having a big problem not only in Chile. I know in the states also in almost um, every country in in Latin America at least, uh, except Bol Bolivia maybe, with inflation. Uh, the, the cost of living is going higher and higher, and there's a, t a big temptation in order to uh, try to solve that by, the, by, by taking atajos. Um, uh, shortcuts. Uh, shortcuts, by, by taking shortcuts and like spending or, or printing money. And we have a really uh, commitment with fiscal responsibility. And we know that way it's gonna take longer for us to recover our economy, maybe. It's uh, gonna be, maybe some, some days it's gonna be unpopular, but we know, uh, and w I'm really convinced that that's for the best and for making changes that last in, the, in time, uh, we have to be responsible in the way we spend money. And that's one thing uh, that in, in Latin America, at least, not everybody seems to be convinced and we are working really hard on it. So security and everyday life, the, the, the cost of living uh, are one of the priorities. But that doesn't mean, and, and, and I wanna uh, re reinforce this, that we have to abandon or we have to forget why we came to power. We came to power with a, manda with a mandate of change. We came to power in order to change the structure of things, not only to administrate what we have. And we are going to do our best to do that. And I don't, I, I don't really uh, feel um, that we are going the wrong way if we are going slower. 
uh, I, I always say we are going, we might go slower because we are going far away. Thank you. So I'll ask my last question and then we will open to student questions. Uh, Latin America as a region is experiencing difficulties with democracy. I, I see it like two different challenges. First, there's a lot of popular discontent with the way democracy is working and the fact that it's not always perceived as helping improve the welfare of its citizens. And that results often in protest and polarization in, in elections, as you've seen in Chile. There's also a second challenge, which is a shift towards authoritarianism in some governments in the region that repress dissent and does not allow for democratic challenges. So if you want to look at the region as a whole and these dual challenges, what do you think would be passed towards building a stronger and more just democracies? Well, you cannot take democracy for granted nowadays. We are in, in our, our country, Chile, uh, has 32 years of democracy and we are uh, getting stronger, but still it's weak. You saw what happened, for example, uh, in Honduras a couple of years ago, what happened in Bolivia uh, a few years ago, what happened in Paraguay, what's going on in, in, in Brazil in a different way. What, what happened, not nowadays with Bolsonaro, but what happened with Dilma. Uh, so, and there are a lot of leaderships that really, uh, or it seems to, to understand democracy as just uh, a tactic. And we have to be prof, uh, profoundly committed with the, the sense of democracy and that implies at least two things. One, you can lose. Two, you have to respect the opinion of the one who thinks different from you. Uh, I always say a, a, a phrase that um, synthesizes what I think, uh, that it's from Albert Camus, uh, that, that he said in, in his chronicles when, when he wrote, he was the director of the Combat, uh, a diary, a newspaper from the Resistance uh, in, in France. And he said once, he wrote once, um, in, in politics, doubt should follow your convictions as a shadow. And I think that is really, really important. Doubt should follow your convictions as a shadow. Because if you are not able to doubt from what you are doing, that doesn't, mean you're, that doesn't mean that you have to be insecure. That means that you have to question yourself what you're doing and try to listen what someone else has to say about what you're doing. Uh, because if you don't do that, you become a fanatic. And, uh, and we've seen fanatics. Uh, you've seen them here uh, in the States, the last president. I mean, uh, we have them on, we, we, had, we have them on, on, on Chile also. And that means that you might be wrong. And I think that's really important for democracy. I, I, I had a, a really great talk to uh, Emmanuel Macron and I told him my, my main uh, reference in France or, or the, the, the people which we, we had relations, political relations, uh, are uh, La, France, La France Insoumise, the Jean-Luc Mélenchon. But one of the things I value from what Macron is doing now is that uh, he doesn't take democracy for granted because he had to face Le Pen in the last elections. And th that means that we have to compromise. Uh, with people that not necessarily think exactly the way we are. Politics, for me, are, uh, it's not a place for feeling, for feeling well and like going to bed uh, thinking, okay, I defended, uh, I standed on my, my convictions uh, and I didn't move one centimeter from what I thought, but I didn't change anything. That's not worth it. You have, uh, politics are for changing for better people's life and you have to do that, uh, for, for doing that, you have to be very humble. And that's, uh, uh, that's really hard when you're in power because as you can see now, I'm talking to like 200 students uh, and that uh, m m gets you dizzy. 
sometimes. So you have to always remember why you are here, why we're doing this, and uh, let doubt follow you as a shadow. Thanks. So the students could line up for asking questions. Uh, if you want to ask a question, you can line up behind the microphone, which is there. Can you see the microphone? So you need to line up there. And you need to say your name, your school, and please be, be, be brief and succinct, and don't make a statement, just make a question. So know, the first uh, person, I please. Know, um, this is not uh, very diplomatic, but I'm going to take off my jacket. I'm from the south, from the, uh, and I'm really hot in here. <laughs> so please, allow me. It is hot. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Mariana Reyes, uh, Columbia College, fellow Latin American from Mexico. And my question is, in a region where most people are mainly concerned about problems like corruption and security, how can the left continue to build majorities around other ideological parts of the agenda? Maybe we should uh, accumulate some questions. Yes. Okay, and, uh, let's get three questions and then okay. get the president no, back. El ventilador. ¿Se puede poner el ventilador? Ah, no, el ventilador. Pero bueno, eso. Ya. Yeah. Hi. Thank you, President Boric. Uh, my name is Carlos Del Buja. I'm from Quito, Ecuador. And my question is, you, you are the face of a new left uh, in Latin America uh, after the socialism of the 21st century, after Correa, uh, after Chavez. What do you think is the future of the left in, uh, in Latin America? Thank you. Okay, the third question, and then we get back to the president. Oh, hi, president and the professor. So first of all, thank you so much for being here. And uh, my name is Alan, I'm from China, first year master. So my question is kind of personal. So right now I know a lot of students is, 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 is elect for students leader position on campus. And I am currently running for a position for my program. So I want to ask, as a president, what is like the best strategy when you're running for a student <laughs> leader position? Thank you. <laughs> okay, I think we can get it yeah. back to you. Can, can uh, the, the Mexican girl, can, can she repeat the question? Because I was like in the, yeah. C can you repeat the, the question, please? Yeah, the, they the were both about the left. I think that the opportunities uh -huh. for the left in the region. Yeah, it was in Latin America where most people are concerned about problems they don't necessarily relate to ideology, such as corruption or security. Uh -huh. How does the left build majorities around more ideological parts of the agenda? Yeah, I think both no. the two first questions were about what should the left mm -hmm. do or the new left do in Latin America. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think there, there, there are some uh, civilizatory advances that we should defend. And I've seen with preoccupation that uh, there's a wave of uh, questioning or putting into or attacking some things that are really important. And it doesn't matter if you are from uh, far right, far left, uh, those are civilizatory mandates. For example, one, respect of human rights. Respect of human rights has to be, has to has no dub, double standard. Is that okay, is well said? So it really uh, pisses me off when you cannot, uh, when you are from, from the left, and so you condemn the uh, violation of human rights in, I don't know, Yemen or in El Salvador, but you cannot talk about Venezuela or Nicaragua. Or Chile, or Chile. Uh, in Chile we had several human rights violations in the, in, in the social unrest. And you, don't have to have double standard. And that might, might uh, cost, cost you in the, in the more, for, let, let me put you an example. I started w when I was a congressman to ask questions about Venezuela. Uh, ask myself questions. I went to Venezuela in 2010 
uh, when Chavez was still alive. And then I started asking myself questions when I saw the repression of the protests uh, and the um, manipulation of uh, some elections. And I, I said, well, this is not right. We have to be able to criticize it. And people in the left in Chile said, no, 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 no. You don't talk about our friends. And I think that's completely wrong. In, in order to have a, a future, the, the left parties, we have to have just one moral standard, especially, especially because it's very sensitive for the world, but for Latin America in human rights. You cannot condemn just what the states are doing, what the United States are doing uh, abroad, if you, or, or, or I, I don't know, you can put an example, if you don't, if you're not able to see what uh, your partners or the, the people that you think are your partners are, are doing. That's one thing. Um, one other thing, I think that uh, we have to defend ideology. Politics are not public policies, not only public policies. Of course, you have to uh, have good uh, and, and committed uh, technicians in, in, in order to, to do uh, w w your program. But you don't have to, to re uh, re uh, quit, to quit ideology. Uh, and in, so I really believe that the distribution of wealthness and power is really important to build a new society. And I really believe that uh, we have to, to march in a long way in order to one day we might uh, abolish uh, so, uh, social classes. That's not gonna happen from the one day to another and if that happens, it's gonna happen with democracy, uh, not by any dictatorship and, and that's one thing that we learned from the past and I think that's really important. Um, the, the other thing is that there, there are some, some topics, some issues that it, it's, uh, let, let me say this in Spanish. There are some things that would appear as if the arguments never change and the left and the right, they are always in their same positions and they never move. So the politics, I think, it's not static. What do I mean by this? For example, in the international business, so it's something that's very much discussed right now. Some people believe that if you're on the left, you have to be protectionist. And, but I am very convinced that the left has to be in uh, very solid. It, it, we have to be a part of the world today. So how can we make sure that this will benefit the people and not only the large companies? That is a different topic, different discussion, but we cannot fall into some sort of um, economic situation that, that means we have to realize some things, we have to have a progress, we have to change our view, our aspect of socialism in the last century, because that failed. And so we have to take ownership of that failure. And uh, this doesn't mean that we need to then think that neoliberalism is the only solution, not at all. We're tr trying to find them uh, nowadays in Latin America with Gustavo Petro, um, with what's, <laughs> uh, and with with other partners. And for the last question, uh, I, I understood that uh, it. He's running. He is presenting a candidature for a position as a student. Advice is uh, one, one guy once asked me in Chile, uh, how can I, uh, I do it? I, I want to be president of Chile, he told me. Uh, how can I do it? First of all, don't wish to be president of, of Chile. <laughs> so uh, go, go slow. Uh, beware or beware of the preoccupations that your, 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 your partners have 
don't. Uh, I, I, you know, Lenin w once said something that I, I think it's very lucido. Uh, lucid? Lucido? See, brilliant. Br uh, brilliant. He said, uh, being ahead of your time, it's an, ele an elegant way of being mistaken. Uh, and uh, so go slow. Okay, we're gonna go to that side, so maybe three questions on that side. Uh, my name is Devin, I'm enrolled in the School of General Studies. Sir, you're one of the youngest world leaders on a stage that's increasingly led by some of the oldest leaders we've ever had, especially in this country. What do you think it took for uh, Chile to embrace its next political generation, and what do you mm. think it'll take in other nations around the world for people who want change to elect their next political generation to office? question. Hi, my name is Alexandra. I'm studying sustainability management here at Columbia. Um, I'm curious to know your opinion about uh, how to prioritize indigenous community rights with the increasing pressure for um, extracting minerals like lithium and copper um, and for the energy, clean energy transition. Hello, my name is Nassam and I'll take the liberty of asking this question in Spanish. Um, uh, my question to you is a little bit, uh, a little putting aside, uh, it's a little more of a reflection. I want to ask you about your reflection after seven months governing in terms of the expectations versus realities. You as, as a student, as an activist, Things that when you're on the other side of the fence, you thought it was simpler maybe than you realized or not. At the same time, I want to ask you if this has allowed you to be, have more empathy with other governors before you, maybe when you were a student, you didn't have that perspective. The, the first question, I don't think there's an intrinsic is, is intrinsic, yeah. intrinsic value on youth. Um, Salvador Allende once said something that uh, I, I said it yesterday. Uh, there, um, there are. Lo voy a decir en, en español. Uh, hay jóvenes viejos. There's y viejo joven. youth who act like old people, and then we have elderly who are young inside. In a beautiful speech in Guadalajara in 1971, what I, what I mean by this is that there is no a, a virtue per se in being young, in youth. One of the issues that we have in Chile and that I see happening in other places of the world is that generations, they don't talk to each other. So the main leaders, I admire uh, Bernie, Trump, and um, Biden, President Biden. But, pero. It would be great, and I don't know if it's happening because I've never talked to them, that um, Alexandra Casi cortez is talking, and I think she is. She's talking to Bernie. Ocasio cortez she's talking to Bernie and learning about experiences, sharing experiences. Uh, something that we did wrong in Chile. Talk with uh, past generations, and at one time we thought that the story uh, began with us, and that's a huge, huge mistake. My recommendation first is to read a lot of history. Read a lot of history. Uh, it has a lot of clues, a clues, for, uh, a lot of clues for 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 the present challenges. Um, and the, the other thing, and it might sound contradictory, but it's not, it's you don't have to ask permission. You don't have to ask, uh, like, can I have a space here? Uh, you have to, uh, uh, if you're young, you have to try and, and push the barriers, the push the fence, uh, and, and not being so politically correct all the time. Um, and one third, uh, thing in that it's really important is in, in times of high individuality, uh, we have to work together. Uh, you won't accomplish any important change if you are just working alone or, um, or predicando solo. Tiene que ser acción colectiva. And the collective action, it takes more time. It takes more time. 
you know, you, you might think um, I'm young because I am, I'm 36, but we, uh, my, my generation was like 15 years, 15 years um, in absolute marginality in Chile. Uh, and we, we had, for example, uh, before the big strikes in 2011, uh, the student movement, uh, we had a lot of assemblies with no people. We had a lot of meetings that failed. We had a lot of um, a, a lot of marches uh, where the, we had really little pe little people. So, as one one great um, professor said once, and I, I really like to use this phrase: uh, success tends to to get you dizzy. In failure, you will find uh, experience and it will get you stronger. So don't be afraid of losing. Don't be afraid of, of, of trying and not making it. Uh, I know it sounds like uh, a little bit uh, auto ayuda uh, when, when, I, when I'm saying it in English. <laughs> I, I don't want to be that guy. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, uh, I'm not charging for this. Uh, but but I, I really think that's true. Um, about lit lithium and copper, I I'm not sure if I, I got the first part of the question, but... Uh, it's the tension between indigenous communities and extractive industries. Yeah, yeah I, I think it's not only with indigenous communities, it's with communities, uh, with all communities. Um, and I, I was talking to a, a CEO of a big, uh, big mining company today in the Council of the Americas, and uh, he, he told me something like this, we screw it up in Australia. We screw it up and we destroyed some uh, archae archaeological heritage and we, we almost uh, lost all of our reputation. So he, he was asking me, what do you think we can do uh, in Chile not to repeat that? And I, I, I thought, well, you have to we all, uh, government, companies, and communities have to have a, a talk about why, for example, copper and lithium are necessary to fight the climate crisis. So uh, I really wanna feel, uh, I wanna that the, the, the people in Chile feel part of the solutions that the world needs. And that way, uh, the not in my backyard attitude, uh, I think we can, we can work on that and, and take it away. Of course, uh, there's a tension with uh, local communities and, uh, and, and big companies. So I think the, the government has to mediate, not in order to assure the, the profits of the company, but in order to preserve the, the, the commonwealth, el bien común, the commonwealth, uh, and uh, in, in, in common good, common good, sorry. Uh, and I think we, we are trying, and, and some companies, well, uh, another thing that we have to change our mind is not all, not all companies are the devil. Uh, there are some that really are some really like the devil, uh, but not all of them, not all of them. And there, there are companies that are really trying and, and, and thinking uh, how can uh, we contribute to facing the, the big troubles that we have in the world. And we have to uh, do partnership with, with those. Uh, and I think that if, in, if you involve indigenous communities, local communities from the first from the start of the process, uh, we will get to an agreement. An agreement that it's not only about money, because one big mistake that big companies do is that they go to a community, they offer a lot of money, and if someone say no, they offer more money, and they break up communities, and that really screw it up. That's not the way, that's not the way. We have to talk about which is the common good that we are chasing and, and, and that might take a little bit longer. But we also have to know that we don't have much time. L let me, uh, I'm sorry, I'm uh, talking too much. 
No, but I'll go ahead. No, but there was a last question ah. about what changed now that ah, you are yeah, in yeah. power of your, of your view from when you were, I guess, out of power. You know, <clears throat> um, when, when I came to office, one minister um, of Piñera um, gave me a guitar as a gift. Uh, and he, he was a really nice guy, Juan Jose Osa. And he told me, uh, you will find out that other things with guitar. I don't know if uh, you say this in, in it, it's a, a slang. Otra cosa con guitarra. It doesn't feel the same when you are in power. That's what he wanted to say. Uh, and of course it's true. And, but I don't feel comfortable with, with saying because I'm in power, now uh, people that are, are in power have to empathize uh, with people that were in power before because for example uh, i think that we would have done things different as the last government did i don't think that we are morally better than them i think we are ideologically different from them uh, and so power is, is it's not a place that force you to go just one way it's true that uh, there is a lot of, of um, in, uh, incentives uh, para acomodarse, para no cambiar. Incentives. So, yo por lo menos creo de que it's good to feel a little bit uncomfortable in power, uh, in order to don't forget why you're here, where you came from, and uh, still fight for your ideals. You don't have to quit your ideals uh, to to uh, be in government. So we have less than 10 minutes, so we'll take one at a time. Uh, hi, thank you so much for being here, Mr. President. My name is Magdalena Palavecino. I am from Chile, and I am studying at Melman School of Public Health. I'm getting a master's in health administration. And my question has to do with what Professor Murillo asked earlier. I know she mentioned what the plan is to gather the country together and to move forward with the creation of a new constitution. I know you talked about the priorities of the government today, that being personal security and tackling inflation, but is there a plan uh, in place today on how the Constitution is going to be rewritten? No. Is it going to be through the Congress, or could you provide some insight on the new Constitution and that process? Sure. Thank you. Mejor que contestes una a la vez por el tiempo. Yo no estoy tan apurado. No, pero el evento termina a las cuatro. ¿Ah? I'd rather you answer one at a time. You can stay longer if you want. It's good with us. This is why you shouldn't be a president. Other people manage your time. It's uh, Valentina, what's your name? Palavecino? Magdalena. Magdalena. That question is very uh, sensitive uh, because right now we are having negotiations in Congress in order to decide how to move forward. And I, the government, we have an opinion as far as how we have to proceed. However, we also understand that our role, our main role today, is to facilitate that agreement. And like you said before, to govern, we have to take charge of the urgencies and the issues of today. So today, like, I don't know if there's a, uh, I'm not trying to uh, give tips to the Congress about the content of, on, on this agreement. I do think some things are evident. One, the people in Chile, they show and they told us what they wanted through a constitution in October, written by a specific organ, 100% elected for that end, to that end. So the idea of the new constitution that we, we can get to it just uh, between an agreement or just with an agreement between the political parties or a group of experts uh, designated by the political parties that wouldn't answer to the demand of the Chilean people as it was uh, voted in the, in the uh, plebiscite. I think there is a general consensus. What I hope will happen is that we have a new convention with uh, clear, uh, more clear uh, borders and, you know, this 
will be discussed right now, is being discussed in Congress. We also have to take into account prior experience and also get support from committees, experts, and people who contribute for this conversation to be more agile and, and facilitated, uh, I believe, and uh, the people in the right, they have been a little more, uh, they, they don't really like these changes. They committed with Chileans and Chiles. They said they also wanted a new constitution. So I hope that this will be an opportunity to find consensus and to be able to finally get to a, a point of gathering and not something, not, not an axle to divide people and continue more conflict for more decades. So from my point of view, I hope this is more about the content and the, the building. I hope this is more general. The constitution doesn't have to cover each of the the, the demands in the society. I think it has to be a framework, a common framework that allows politics and politicians to be able to ask the questions that we haven't asked just yet. And I do hope that this consensus will happen uh, soon in Chile to to assure others that, uh, well, in Chile, we, we're tired, we're exhausted about the, on this topic. So I hope that we can reach an agreement pretty, pretty soon. Uh, thank you so yes, much thank for coming, Mr. President. Uh, uh, my name is Joseph. I'm in Columbia College. Uh, so you mentioned earlier that the left has historically had trouble discussing security issues, uh, and specifically personal security ones. And I know that around the world, a lot of right-wing governments and leaders have adopted the idea of personal security yeah. and securitization uh, and implemented them in a lot of their policies. So how do you think that the left can most effectively discuss, communicate, and also legislate on personal security issues without alienating parts of their population? Well, th th there's, um, we have to avoid, uh, I don't know, if, uh, penal populism, populismo penal. We have to avoid penal populism. Uh, in Chile, we're having a problem that um, if a crime is committed, one congressman uh, stands up with a law for that kind of crime. And that it's, uh, uh, it, it really distorts the, the necessary, um, how, how you can say this? Um, In Castellano? No, la, um, el, the equilibrium that the, uh, the, the, the penal system has to have. And, but we have to, to uh, reivindicate the concept of authority, I think. Um, I would, uh, the, 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 in, in, in the left, in, in the left, uh, in the new left, because in, in, in the 20th century it wasn't like this, there is like an, uh, a mood of, of saying any authority is, it's bad, it's, uh, it's like, we want to keep far away from it. And we need, for example, we need the police. We need the police to uh, make sure that laws are respected. And we have to reivindicate the value of law. And I think that we have been a little bit weak uh, in, in, uh, in reivindicating that. Of course, we cannot abandon the structural cause causes of the problems. For example, one of the main problems I think that Chile has now is inequality. We cannot forget that the social unrest of 2019 came because Chileans uh, felt that the growth that all the politicians were talking about in the media, uh, they didn't show it in their daily lives. And that inequality expresses in how you build the cities, uh, how much uh, time you take in public transport, uh, how long is the waiting list in, uh, for, for health uh, operations and, and stuff. So we can do both. We can uh, reinforce authority and uh, be like uh, saying uh, the police has to have the tools in order to uh, combat crime not uh, being populist in, in a penal way, and in the other hand, uh, 
struggling for structural reforms in order to achieve uh, a more equalitarian uh, regime. Um, I know, <laughs> and I'm a little bit frustrated with myself now because I know uh, that doesn't answer uh, the, the profound sense of the question. I would love to, maybe if, if you like, we can, uh, I'll, um, we, can, we can have another conversation or we can uh, have in, in some more other days like uh, a virtual conversation and I can write down some answers and try trying to develop more uh, profound ideas about this because I don't want to become like one, uh, as, as I said before, uh, a leader of just uh, big quotes. I, I know uh, you are uh, college students and you have uh, deep uh, preoccupations and I, I would love to uh, insist or or go fur further on that. Thank you. One last question. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. President, to be here. My name is Rosario. I'm getting a Master of Public Administration here at the Columbia. I will ask my question in English. <laughs> so we all know the relationship with indigenous people is a very important issue in Latin America in general and today particularly in Chile. My question is, considering security is one of the most pressing issues in our country today, as you mentioned before, what solution or path do you see today to the Mapuche conflict that is threatening the Araucanía region and its people? First of all, I don't think there's a Mapuche conflict. Uh, there's a conflict between the state of Chile and uh, the, the pueblo Mapuche. It's not the, their only problem. No, no, for yeah. sure not. Uh, and, uh, and that's important because uh, the, the way we we phrase the, the problems, shape them also. Uh, we used to say, when I was at a school, uh, and it, that wasn't long ago, uh, I was taught that the conquest, the, the conquest of the, 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 the conquest of the South in Chile was called the pacification of the Araucanía. And in, in Argentina, they, to, they, they the conquest of the desert. The conquest, the conquest of the desert. It was a una política de exterminio. It was a policy of exter, extermination. So, so therefore, it's important, I believe, to really try to show how complex this topic is, and the problem between the state of Chile and the Mapuche people, it is not mainly a problem of public order. It has problems that comes in public order, and it has to do with, yes, serious violence, which is intolerable, and there is no justification for this from the brutal killings of uh, people and also there was an attack in Carbuco recently. That, they, that is all horrendous. So I believe in order to advance, we need to have a clearer policies regarding this and we are working on this and, the, and it's also some positive uh, news in Chile to return lands. We need to progress against the autonomy, but this does not mean that the country is going to be divided, no. It's like an autonomy like they have in New Zealand and in Canada and Bolivia are also working on this. And then to provide services that in the that part, Araconia, does not exist many times. So we're talking about things like electricity, water, roads. And on the other hand, also be very strict, as you probably have seen, with the people who insist that violence is their path. No, violence will not be the way of solving this conflict, and we are going to pose the whole strength of the law against that. But at the same time, the majority of the Mapuche communities that are peaceful, we are going to move ahead with political policies, but also to provide, well, recognize their existence and their situation and the right to exist as a people and therefore their right to autonomy. Thank you.
for this fantastic opportunity to discuss with us. And I think this has been great. I think everyone has been extremely pleasant experience of learning so much from this conversation and your answers to every one of us. Well, I, I learn a lot in this, uh, in, in, in this kind of, uh, of activities because you, you make us question ourselves. Uh, so thank you for the interest. Uh, I'm sorry we couldn't uh, answer all the questions. Uh, I, I remember that we have an important meeting uh, now. <laughs> You'll find out in, in a couple of hours. Um, but, but I'm really grateful, grateful uh, for you, the teachers, University in Columbia, and of course the students. And I invite you to organize yourself because uh, the university, it's a really uh, great place to, to think of the common good and then to take it out to society. Thank you very much. Thanks to you.